Hi, everybody. I'm Addison Snell with Intersect 360 Research. Um, we're analysts covering the high performance computing space, market sizing, forecasting, technology trend analysis, spending analysis. We look into other areas that overlap into HPC, like cloud and big data, workstations, all of these wonderful topics. Uh, at the start of the year, uh, it's always nice to kind of do a, a trends presentation, uh, not based on uh, you know what happened last year, but really start to take a look at synthesizing that and, and put it into some predictions uh, looking forward. And that's what we've endeavored to do here, kind of building on uh, where we wound up with 2014. I will say that these HPC advisory uh, council meetings have been very illuminating. We're, uh, despite us being a small company, trying to support them uh, all over the world as much as we can, as, as often as we can get to them. Uh, we find these to be really the best uh, end user focused uh, HPC uh, meetings uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, really, when we've been talking to our clients recently, the pervading theme going back to supercomputing has been that it's really clear now that we've entered what you can look at as a new era in high performance computing. And what I mean by that is if we look back in time, it's easy to start segmenting out architectural eras, starting with things like the vector era, and then that gives way to a RISC SMP based kind of era where everything was on Unix. Then we went into a Beowulf cluster era. That era, I think we've really transitioned away from now, and we're going into a new era other than you know what we can in retrospect call the Beowulf era. Going forward, I don't know what you want to call the new one, the core era, the multi-core, many-core era. And here's why we say this. When you look at the different eras in computing, they tend to be marked by, well, what they have in common is they always talk about the democratization of high performance computing. There's always the idea of bringing more rich, delicious flops per dollar into the conversation and more people have access to all these technologies and look how great uh, you can push supercomputing down the market. That certainly was in, uh, the case in transitioning vector processors to uh, risk-based processors and then going into the x86 Beowulf era. Uh, and now is true again with, with uh, multi-core processors and many-core accelerators. There's a lot more raw performance out there. But also with every step, there's an implied change in programming model. What you, how you programmed a vector computer was different from how you programmed a RISC computer, and it's different from how you programmed a cluster, and now we're facing these changes in programming models again. And you look at uh, DK's talk from earlier, and all the discussion around MPI plus X, and what's the X going to be, and how are we going to parallelize for these systems going forward, is very much the conversation in the industry right now. And, and the final thing I would underscore here in looking at the real difference between this Beowulf era and where we are now, even though he left the word Beowulf behind, the notion of a Beowulf cluster when we started out, one of the big driving factors behind the cluster revolution was the notion of standards and portability. And uh, this also goes back to the uh, earlier talks today where people talk about commodity clusters or industry standard clusters. The thing is that's really gotten kind of broken. The idea of a Beowulf cluster was that I could put things into MPI once, and then it would be portable to any cluster that I moved it over to, and that was a big advancement. And it brought around this idea of an industry standard cluster. Well, today, if there's such a thing as an industry standard node, I don't know what it is, right? Because by the time you look at x86 and accelerated x86 and GPUs and APUs and ARM coming into the equation, the Open Power Initiative, FPGAs, floating point DSPs, and plus a couple of risks that are still around, like uh, Spark and, uh, and Power, of course, which I already mentioned. This is the big stress point on the end user community right now, not knowing today what the dominant architecture is that I want to start following this forward on. So it's not just that you're faced with the programming model challenge of how do I handle GPUs or Xeon Fire or what have you, but that we're still selecting which architectures are going to be most appropriate for which applications going forward. Are, are you going to have one dominant architecture? Are we going to specialize into a lot of different types of architectures? And this is really an underlying theme in all of the trends going forward, 
that you really have to revisit these programming models. Up on the slide, these are just a couple of blogs that we've written related to this topic that are on the Top 500 website, top500.org, one, one by me around the supercomputing time frame, and then uh, by Michael Feldman, one of our other analysts, uh, uh, just a couple weeks ago, entitled Life Beyond Moore's Law. Uh, both of them really drawing on this theme of moving forward to a new era in high performance computing. Um, one of the big areas to look at here that we're building off of is some research we did for the United States Council on Competitiveness. Uh, you can find this report, the SOLVE report is actually a free download from the Council website, www.compete.org, under the Publications tab. You can also go to our website and find a webinar on it. I think it's still on the front page of our website, or you can find it under our presentation section. But uh, we were retained by the Council on Competitiveness to look at a detailed study on uh, the adoption of next generation supercomputing technologies, new levels of supercomputing scalability, specifically for U.S. industry. And I'll apologize that it was a U.S. focused study and that it was funded by a U.S. government organization. My personal opinion is that the findings in the study would equally apply to industry regardless of geography. I think we were looking at some high level uh, uh, dynamics that would apply to industry in, in Europe or Asia just as well in terms of the adoption of high performance computing. I've selected just a couple of the charts and findings here. Uh, the full study is available for download. It, it looks intimidating at 75 pages, but uh, the back half of it is all appendices and you can just look stuff up there and there's lots of quotes and tables and charts. It's actually a pretty good read. There were 101 uh, survey participants, all of whom were U.S. industrial, and then there were 13 deeper dive interviews that provided a lot of quotes that are color commentary throughout where you can find uh, industrial uh, uh, comments around this. Um, one of the figures from the chart asked about the projected need for more scalability in high performance computing. So again, this is industrial respondents, and it's of all sizes, up and down. And uh, it's all small here, but the, sen the, uh, the essential question was, agree or disagree on a market research five-point scale, um, you know, could you use, two, could you use double your performance increase over the next five years? Could you use a 5x performance increase over the next five years, et cetera? And let me see, is there a laser pointer on this? Awesome. So this row here is we could use 10x performance increase over the next five years. And you, between these two bars on the right here, you essentially have more than two-thirds agreement among industrial users that they could consume a 10x performance increase over the next five years. And again, there's lots of other quotes and charts behind this. And if you go all the way up here, this bottom row is we could use a thousand X performance increase over the next five years. Like if you waved your magic wand and bang, you, you took them to another prefix of power. Within five years, they think, they think a third of respondents think that they could consume that. That's an enormous amount of increase. So we're underlining the increase, or rather the perpetual need for increased performance, increased scalability over time. So why don't you do that? And there's a lot in the study about justification and ROI and things like that. This just gets to the five point scale on how big a limitation are all of these different barriers. And there's things on here uh, like the cost, the scalability, facilities, power, cooling, programming, et cetera. And you get the, the, the uh, ones, this is not a problem on the, on the left, up to five, this is an insurmountable hurdle over here on the right. And the number one limitation to getting 10x greater scalability in this study came out of scalability of software. And that showed up in all the different market segmentations we looked at. Moreover, we did the same chart again, not copied here, but asking about 1,000x in performance, what are the greatest barriers? And then scalability of software still stayed as kind of number one, maybe number one, maybe number two, depending on how you define it, where the other one that joins it is the cost of the hardware, which will always be a problem to going to a thousand X. But scalability of software, the software scalability issues were really paramount, a driving theme throughout this entire study. It, everything just kept pointing back to software. Not that we were looking for that, it was largely unbiased in terms of how we were surveying it, but it became an inescapable conclusion that these software issues were really what was gonna drive, or rather hinder, uh, scale, uh, supercomputing adoption in, uh, in industry. And then we wanted to look at 
what kind of software there is. Now, I think generally, when you think about software and commercial, your mind tends to run to purchase licensed commercial ISV software. That's tip, uh, especially been uh, uh, historically true in engineering segments where you get things like CAE, CFD. Those have been dominated by uh, ISV codes uh, from ANSYS or LS Diner or what have you. Um, <clears throat> we looked at what's the mix of commercial ISV software, in-house software, and open source software across all these different sites. And this is a bit of a complicated chart, so I'll explain it to you. It's actually not that bad once you understand what we're doing. The, the basic question is, what's your percent mix of ISV in-house and open source? And they'll give you three numbers that'll then add up to 100%. And then they're plotted into an equilateral triangle where the closer you pull to any given vertex is, is the more of that software that you have. So if you're looking at what the percent of commercial ISV software is, the base of the triangle down here is 0%. And then you go vertically through 20, 40, 60, 80, this vertex would be 100% commercial. And then if you want open source, tip your head 60 degrees to the right, this side of the triangle on the left is 0%. And you go through the green numbers, 20, 40, 60, 80, this vertex would be 100%. And then similarly, the other angle, the right side is 0% in-house, and the bottom left vertex is 100% a, is a in-house. And then look what happens. This black dot, which is the average of all respondents, is almost dead in the middle. It's not more than 40% anything. And what we've really seen in this and our other research, our site census studies for, for HPC users and the like, is that we've seen a trend where commercial ISV software is getting increasingly replaced by in-house software and, uh, and open source software, driven primarily by the challenge in licensing costs and licensing models among the ISV community when faced with these multi-core and many-core architectures. Cloud doesn't make it a whole lot better either. You've still got to figure out how the ISVs are trying to capture value for their software. And sticking up for the ISV for a second, I don't think this is a case of the ISV is trying to gouge anybody. Scalability of software actually does get harder here, and no one is offering to pay more for software. So really what you're talking about is how do I get my software to scale over a lot more cores without me paying any more money for it? I'm not going to take sides in that other than to say it's a big challenge. And with, the, with that cost challenge has come a, a much greater mix of in-house and open source software uh, into people's workflows. Now, if you look at it by industry, there are a few differences you can pin out, like financial services and energy down here, the blue dot and the yellow, they pull a little harder toward in-house, and biosciences will pull a little more toward open source and the like. But the bigger learning point was how clustered toward the middle this was uh, on, on average. And, and it's hard to go forward on this and say, well, we just need to solve the ISV problem or just need to solve the open source problem. This is a three-legged stool of how are you going to get applications to scale in this new era of HPC. OK, so taking those thoughts into Supercomputing 14, there was a lot of noteworthy vendor news. Most, I think the biggest story, interestingly enough, was the Coral announcement, the uh, collaboration of Oak Ridge, Argonne, and Livermore. Two of those three supercomputers got announced in terms of the, uh, some of the terms, some of the details, some of the architectures. And it really went toward open power. So the open power consortium for IBM, uh, Mellanox, NVIDIA, the winning technologies on those. The Argon, that was Oak Ridge and Livermore. The Argon one was not announced and is still pending. I would guess that the short money is on an Intel architecture for that one, but uh, I couldn't officially say anything else. We're still awaiting that announcement. The reason that's important, you know, it's weird that you would say the biggest story would be a future announcement of a supercomputer that we all already knew was coming anyway, except that moving toward open power. Um, first of all, it was a, an important win for IBM in that this was their first supercomputing show following the Lenovo divestiture of all their x86 architectures. And IBM really did have a need to say they are still in the HPC and supercomputing business. And I think this underscored their ongoing commitment to that. But it also showed the uh, relevance of, um, of, of the, the ability to put together a, a, a compelling supercomputing uh, bid that didn't rely on x86 anywhere. 
uh, there really is this notion of a non-X86 ecosystem that's emerging, and I'll come back to touch on that in just a minute. Um, all of the accelerator roadmaps advanced. Bull revealed an exascale platform strategy. I thought that was very interesting in terms of the possibility that uh, the EC could come in with an exascale plan. That really hasn't uh, been a big announcement there, but this was really driven on the vendor side that Bull would announce a, a strategy that processing architecture is willing. You could connect the dots and infer that Bull is saying that they could field an exascale system in the 2020 time frame. Uh, I thought that was really noteworthy. Lenovo, um, you know, all of a sudden is established as an HPC vendor and a dominant one with a big share that they're following up on all the IBM systems. They've got an individual one teraflop server node uh, that really gets them right in that game. Dell had their own uh, GPU heavy, uh, very dense node, SGI with the UV portfolio. SGI's been doing a lot with shared memory, big memory systems again. Uh, in particular in the big data related space, we see a, a trend there where the larger memory platforms have a lot of applicability for, for in-memory database as an example. Uh, and SGI finding the relevance there. Huawei coming out of nowhere um, with a, uh, a, another big memory server. They gave a, a marketing talk that really sounded a lot like an SGI ultraviolet marketing talk around their, their larger memory uh, footprint. Uh, Mellanox had probably one of the bigger technology announcements getting in the, the 100 gig uh, the 100 gig space. That was a big uh, advancement on the interconnect side. And then um, a 48 core ARM chip uh, out there also. Now, I do this not only to try to get all my clients onto a slide, but to point out the diversity again of everything going on here. All of these are really noteworthy in different ways, and it's hard to look through this and say, well, aha, GPUs or ARM or open power is going to win. Right? There's a lot of advancements in all of these different parts of the ecosystem. And if you're on the end user side, trying to plan a new supercomputing strategy, a new HPC strategy out over the next 10 years, you're looking at this. And what a lot of people are doing right now is they're just testing a little bit of everything. So when you see a really high proportion of GPU systems or Xeon Phi systems out there right now, they're still not, they still don't tend to be large-scale production systems. Most of them are small-scale testing systems still in the near term as the end users select uh, who their horses are going to be in the race going forward. It really sets up this first bullet here, this Intel versus the world. It's not really the world. There are a lot of people who will be on Intel slide, on Intel side, but it sounds more dramatic when you say it this way. But I really see this as being driven by IBM. This has been a game of strange bedfellows that's been playing out over the last few years. And with the divestiture of the x86 server business from IBM to Lenovo, now really comes to a head where now there really is a line in the sand. And on one side of the sandbox, you have Intel. And on the other side of the sandbox, you have screw you, Intel, right? And IBM has elected themselves the captain of the screw you Intel team and they're going to recruit as many people as they can onto that team and Nvidia and Mellanox are kind of natural enemies with Intel in a few different areas so you know they go over to that side and Cray you can presume is more you know wedded to Intel on that side with some of the deals they've made so they'll be over there where this really gets interesting to me is when you look at the people who are you know, currently friendly with everybody, but you ask yourself how long that can go on, right? Like take a volume server vendor like HP or Dell. That's a great case study to me because if you're Dell today, you can put out a server that has an Intel processor and a Mellanox InfiniBand and NVIDIA GPU and whoever's file system you like, and that's not a problem. Can you do that next year? Sure, probably. How about in three years? I, Maybe not. Certainly not five. I think three years is kind of maybe around the end of the roadmap of you've got to start looking at which side of the sandbox you're going to play on because Intel is going to aggressively try to incorporate as many technologies on chip as possible. And you're going to reach a point where you have to be either all Intel or no Intel on this stuff. So you could say, well, you're Dell. That's an easy choice. You'll be Intel, right? Well, maybe. 
right? Because if you go all Intel, well, now you're intentionally choosing the same side of the sandbox where you're presumably going to find Lenovo and Huawei as high volume, low cost below you, and Cray as a high volume, high, scale, or high value, high scalability above you. So what's your differentiation play there as a server vendor? If you're going to go that way, you better really have your eyes open about what your role is as a server vendor. So again, I'm not going to say what Dell should or shouldn't do or pick any side in this. I'm just going to say that this is a huge supply side industry dynamic going on right now that you're going to watch over the next couple of years. It's going to play out in a really weird way. And, and the end user community is, is going to keep their eye on this in terms of selecting who their vendors are. Now, IBM, another way that they're going to try to change the game is they're going to try to move the conversation off of flops and more onto data movement and workflows and data centric computing. It's a little bit ironic in that it was IBM that really popularized the term flops not that long ago. People will forget that it was IBM that first really pushed that marketing term and it was because their chips were the first that had two flops per clock. So they moved the conversation from Hertz to flops to get onto the idea that their chips had double the performance per hertz. Before that, we all talked about hertz, right? And then we got into flops, and now they're going to try to change the conversation again. They either will or won't succeed at that, depending on lots of other things. Um, so the year ahead in HPC, the server vendors are going to reshuffle on market share. If you go back two years, from that going backwards, IBM was really the number one server vendor by revenue uh, pretty much every year. And then HP or Dell would flip flop for the number two spot depending on who had a good year and who had a bad year. Uh, and then you'd get everyone else down, down below that. Well, with IBM selling off the x86 business, first of all, their business took a wallop. I think just because it's hard for your sales rep to have a conversation with the end users when you're in the middle of an 18-month negotiation about selling off a product line that they care about, it's hard to have that conversation with customers. Even before the deal happens, you take a five-point knock on your market share just because it's hard to negotiate with your customers. That, by the end of 2013, had evened it out where IBM, HP, and Dell were all within a percentage point on, on the number one spot. Now with the, the business actually moving over to Lenovo, it falls to either HP or Dell will be number one. I'm not even going to guess which one it is right now. Um, it, Dell was slightly ahead of HP coming into this year. We have to look at who had a better year and dig into the financials, and you'll get to that from us in April or May. We'll have the numbers out from last year. But it'll be HP or Dell. They'll be one, two. Presumably, the Lenovo will be three. Um, presumably IBM will be four. There is a possibility, albeit a remote one, that if IBM had a really bad year and Cray had a really good year, there's an outside chance, but a very slim one, that Cray could catch IBM. Cray has really been moving up fast. Um, standard x86 Beowulf clusters. I should say about Beowulf clusters, I keep using this word to be indicative of the era. It's not that we didn't have any upgrades during that time, right? Most notably, you had the introduction of InfiniBand and the introduction of 64-bit processors, right? Those were both pretty big things. But I keep using the word Beowulf to talk about the era because the notion of portability of MPI didn't change, even if things like form factors or interconnects changed. You went from an Ethernet rack-mounted cluster that was 32-bit to a 64-bit blade-based InfiniBand thing, but it was still basically architecturally the same. Uh, that is yielding now to more specialized systems. This notion of portability you can forget about for the short term. Okay, I get the whole MPI plus X thing, but there were already six different options on, on DK slides, right? And I'm not sure that one of those is going to be the dominant uh, way that you see programming models uh, going forward. And I, I list on this chart um, you know, some of the technologies that we already talked about here. I would put uh, 3D memories into this in terms of uh, other technologies that you see. Uh, ARM and open power could really chip away at x86 dominance. I don't think ARM on its own would. I think ARM, just ARM in a vacuum is, is more interesting to the non-HPC volume space. You would see some people tinker with it in HPC to see what you could do with it, but it would be about the same proportion of people who build HPC systems out of Macs, right? They're out there, but they're more a hobbyist thing. 
But if ARM gets involved with open power and you get into more of these hybrid architectures, what about an ARM GPU or an ARM plus power? Now you're talking about some things that if it developed right, you could really see some, some volume uh, coming up. Here's the 3D memory, uh, which I already mentioned. Uh, accelerator adoption is reaching critical mass. Uh, more than half of new systems this year will contain some kind of accelerator somewhere. I say accelerator, coprocessor, I, I really should say a mini core component. Taking into account that Knight's Landing isn't really an accelerator, but it's a mini core component, I, I would include that uh, in this analysis as well. All right, I don't want to leave out big data, and I, I brought in a couple of slides from uh, a keynote that I just gave the week before last at the uh, SNEA event, the Analytics and, and Big Data Summit. This really does overlap into HPC quite a bit, and you see the use of high-performance computing technologies in big data spaces, whether or not you think of it as HPC or not. And I'm not going to have that argument, but looking at the broader scalable I.O. space, analytics space, there, there is a lot of uh, applicability for HPC technologies. And the big thing that you're going to see is that the frameworks are going to start to commercialize around this. The analogy that I give on this is if you think back to the early days of ERP systems, I mean like around 1999, 2000, the, there was really the Y2K uh, phenomenon that drove a lot of the early ERP adoption. People saying, well, we need to modernize how we do ERP. I bring it up because those early quick turn ERP implementations, they tended to be very expensive, they might be a two or three year IT initiative that goes on. They were consulting led, all of the services involved in how do I move my, my, uh, my organization over to an ERP implementation. By the time you got into the early 2000s, you know, five years into the deal, you really started seeing more commercialized frameworks around it where here's an ERP implementation that, that's easier to walk through. It doesn't cost millions of dollars. It might only cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it might only take you six to 12 months to implement. Now, go on Google right now and type ERP, and you know, you'll get the top five ERP software vendors and a Wikipedia page and everything else around it. It's a very standard thing that you just go out and buy. Uh, I think that same thing's gonna happen with big data, and here we are about three years into it, and you're really starting to see commercialized frameworks that are still based on top of a lot of open source components with Hadoop and Cassandra and HDFS, but then they become uh, rigidized or productized or whatever you like, uh, standard supported offerings from more vendors. You'll see not only big guys like IBM, but smaller ones like Hortonworks coming up with their frameworks, plugins to a standard, uh, to a standard set of solutions. Now, in order for that to evolve, you do need to understand what the specific problem is. Big data is not any particular technology, right? It's, it's kind of a set of trends that, and you have to know what an individual user's big data problem is before you propose a standard solution. Uh, big memory appliances are going to be a big deal here. It's, it's funny to me, I actually worked at SGI for several years, and uh, uh, so I've got some of this shared memory background in me, and I see these shared memory systems coming back and remember being one of the last uh, holdouts with our backs to the wall as clusters were coming in and taking over the shared memory space. To see shared memory make a resurgence in some of these places just kind of makes me chuckle a little bit, and it's amplified by the complications in processing architectures here. This notion of data-centric computing, IBM is really using this theme a lot. I, I, think it will, uh, I think it will catch on. I think you'll hear more than IBM talk about data-centric computing. This notion of moving the compute to the data rather than the other way around, that's a nice idea. I put a little question mark on here, though, because it, it leaves me a little bit going, huh? Because let's face it, the data is actually the only thing that moves here. Okay, we've not, we're not, we're, uh, all the different processor architectures we have, none of them are ambulatory. The processor does not get up and walk around the system depending on where the problem is. You can try to locate processors closer to data, and you see a lot of architectures in both compute and storage that are like that. The processor does not move. Okay, it doesn't move. The data moves around. That's the way that's still going to work. So data center computing, what you're really presumably talking about is designing an architecture where, where you've managed some data locality to the processing elements. Um, that might continue to change some of the 
way that we look at or measure performance in this space. I think flops are not going to be the only relevant measurement going forward. I would not propose that we get rid of it. I think they are a valid metric. I even think the top 500 continues in its relevance going forward, although we need to update it and consider what role it has and where. I think the more complicated it is to talk about the performance of a system, the more you need really simple metrics. And the beauty of top 500 is that it picks one and goes one, two, three, four, five down the list, and people like that. Now, you can argue about how it is you're measuring it, and I think that's a valid argument, but I don't think top 500 will be any less relevant going forward. I think we talk about how we're going to measure systems, but we should keep doing it, and it should still be that simple. By the way, uh, Chris Willard, my chief research officer, and I have some other ideas on that, but I'm not ready to talk to them about it now. See me again for supercomputing, and uh, we'll talk about it at the end of the year, some ideas of how else we might measure systems. Um, some of the important technologies then for big data. Parallel file systems, we gotta keep talking about more here. And not just Lustre or GPFS. Um, those are the two dominant ones right now, but dominant is even a, the wrong word for it because parallel file systems are not well adopted in commercial markets. They're still predominantly found in academic and government research centers. The incidence of true parallel file systems in commercial HPC centers is still below 10%. It's like 7 or 8%. Um, people think I'm crazy. I still think there's an opportunity potentially for PNFS in this environment. It's sitting there basically done. And it's lacking any kind of champion who would move it into the enterprise space and say, here's a solution for moving these things forward. The problem is I don't know who that champion's going to be. Uh, but I think there's still an opportunity for it if anyone wanted to pick it up and move it forward. Um, Luster, it could be Luster if Intel really drives it into that space. IBM, of course, will keep its chips on GPFS and Elastic Storage or whatever they rebrand it to. We got a hint on that earlier today, but that'll be a proprietary IBM technology. The point being, parallel file systems, the need is there, the solutions are not there yet, the adoption is certainly not there yet. This is something that should really tip in commercial markets over the next two years. Now, when someone does go do that, Windows and mobile clients are going to be a big deal because here's the difference between a pure HPC environment and a big data environment is that these are getting integrated into a general IT infrastructure where, guess what, there's still a whole lot of Windows and mobile going around. So you've got to figure out how those Windows devices are going to interact with the presumably more scalable uh, Linux or Unix-based uh, components. Programming environments uh, is on my slide, but I don't know that I could do it any kind of justice after DK's talk other than to say, wow, programming environments, yeah, we're going to have to work on that one. Middleware, job scheduling, optimization, it all goes in there. All right, sure, you have to talk about Flash. Uh, Flash is going to be a big component. It's, it's getting adopted. The thing I like best about Flash here is that at least it's gotten out of this notion that storage equals disk. And a technology I maybe could have put on here that I didn't is tape. Um, and people laugh. Tape is not only prevalent in big data uh, implementations, it's actually growing. Uh, and we are seeing some corner cases where what disappears is the disk, and what you have is flash and tape. Um, there are actually some workflows where that makes sense. Tape is not going anywhere other than potentially upwards, still very relevant in this space, if for no other reason than it offers more bytes per dollar, more bytes per watt, and more bytes per square foot than disk does, with the media lasting about three to five times longer without degrading. Okay, so there's a plenty of value proposition for tape still in this market. You'll see a wide spectrum of storage technologies. On the other hand, Hadoop, although everyone talks about it, needs to be kept in its proper place. It is one specific framework for solving one type of big data problem. It is not synonymous with the big data space, except for when your IT boss, who's only read some articles about big data, kicks a problem downhill and says, we've got to get a jar of that Hadoop stuff to rub on our data center so we won't have a big data problem anymore. And that's about the level of understanding. Okay, Hadoop does belong in some of these areas, 
But, you know, it's a programming model. It's a framework for doing some of these types of analytics work. There is not so much public cloud in this space yet. This is when trends collide. I've given whole presentations on this topic before. But just like there's not a whole lot of wide-scale public cloud adoption in HPC, similar to big data, the security issues, the uh, data management issues, and a long list of other issues keep the adoption low. Um, it, it, to the extent that as an organization you say, look, we really want cloud and we really want big data, okay, fine. What you'll see is a lot of private cloud, hybrid cloud technologies. And, you know, if those burst out to public, uh, public cloud components on an as desired basis, that can only be a benefit. You'll just find that it's not as desired as often as you think it is. Oh, last one on here, I almost skipped. Um, you know, the number one question our clients ever ask us as analysts in any given year is tell us the killer app for something, right? What's the next big app that we have to go get so we get all over it? Like I'm going to tell them it's the Angry Birds of HPC and they'll adopt it before anyone else does next year. It really hasn't been like that. Now, if you push me, what's been the biggest growing thing in big data? Well, that's been Hadoop. But this is a highly disaggregated space at the application level. This isn't even the whole tell me the top five applications to give me 80% of the market. High performance computing, the top 40 applications give you about 45% of the market combined. Big data is more disaggregated than that. It's not as centralized, okay? It's all these onesies, twosies. You're dealing with the tail of the snake here. Most of the snake is the tail, <laughs> all right? That's the way this space is. There's really not a, a dominant, yeah, you could talk about SAP and SaaS and things like that. Sure, they've got a presence. If you measure them by revenue, especially, because they cost a lot more money than the free things do. But if you're looking at what's really gonna set the market, it's really all over the place right now, and I, I hate to disappoint you, but that's the actual answer. Um, growth in the big data market. Big data will continue to grow, but I push back a little bit on what does that mean specifically. You know, when you talk about something like a growth rate, I think if you're a professional analyst, you should be careful about this. Um, there are certainly no shortage of large analyst firms that have come out with their big data forecasts of however many billion dollars at umpty ump percent growth rate. The reason I have trouble with that is because of what I said before, that big data is not a specific technology, right? When you said there's six billion dollars in the big data market, tell me first what is one big data and how much does it cost, right? How many units of big data did you just sell there? I, I really don't get it because what we know for sure from researching this over the last couple years is that predominantly what happens first is people adopt big data into their existing infrastructures. Servers they already have, storage they already have, people they already have. I might download some free software. There's some incremental software spend. Now if you go back to them and say, well, what percent of your IT budget is dedicated to big data this year? They're all 20%. But I'm going and I'm allocating stuff that I already bought. Okay, I didn't bring net new revenue into the market. If the big data market's really growing like that, why isn't the whole enterprise IT market growing? It's coming from somewhere, right? I don't see any analyst who's out there predicting 20% growth rate in the enterprise IT market. So you can't go say, well, this is growing and this one isn't, when this is supposed to be a subset of that. If you run their growth rates out eight years, big data is bigger than the entire enterprise IT market that it's a subset of. It just doesn't make sense, right? So sorry, I, I rant on that, but it bugs me. <laughs> okay, here's the real issue with big data going forward, and, and also HPC, is this help wanted area. And I'm talking about it from the big data perspective here where you know, you'll see someone will put out a rec now where we gotta jump into big data, so I need a data scientist who's got 10 years experience managing this, this, this. Data scientist is a title that you made up like last week. And what everyone's doing is rewriting their resumes to say, well, I've been a data scientist for 25 years. That wasn't a thing, okay? You might have some of those skills, but it wasn't like you majored in data science. And you know, all of these skill sets are changing now. Even if you take something vanilla like system administrator, everyone's got one. 
This is the real implication of these new eras, where every time you move to a new era in computing or have a paradigm shift, you introduce the need for new skill sets even when you didn't change the title. A sysadmin in the vector era had to have very different skills than a sysadmin in the risk SMP era, where now what you're ma managing is a lot, all the different flavors of Unix. Then you go forward to the Beowulf era, all right, we're going to standardize on this Linux, but now I've got to master the whole middleware space on top of that, and that's different. Now you go into this multi-core era, and it's all about optimization and efficiency on all of these different cores. I've been a sysadmin for 40 years, and I keep having to reinvent what it is that I do. Big data, this is just as bad. So if you're talking about you want to go get a data scientist, where are these people coming from? Right? These are supply-side driven wholesale changes, and it's not like the entire workforce of the world reinvented itself overnight. There's going to be a skills gap for a while, okay? and you have to be really careful about this, and especially in big data, because I'm here to tell you as a professional analyst, a bad analyst can do a lot of really bad analysis of good data. okay? So this is one of the biggest problems facing the whole industry, big data, HPC, everything, because of this new era that we're moving into. Other issue, time permitting, and I have two minutes, so I'm going to give it a shot. Who said this in what year? You have zero privacy anyway, get over it. Who remembers this quote? Scott McNeely in 1999. Now, he was talking about the internet era at the time. But as we go into big data, this is going to be another huge issue. And I threw this in here because I was talking to Brian last night about what this theme was with socially responsible computing. I didn't have anything environmental in mind, but I'm thinking socially, and I cast the net broader. So I went and grabbed this. Anyone remember this story? It's from almost exactly a year ago now. Uh, GCHQ, which is the UK equivalent of the NSA, it's kind of their spy guys, have a program called Optic Nerve that was capturing Yahoo webcam video chat images, spying on Yahoo video chats over a period of uh, three or four years and providing their analysts access to all of the images so that they could do things like test facial recognition, look for terrorists, catch the bad guys, all of these things that sound really good. This story really blew up. It was leaked to the, Gu the Guardian had it first. It was leaked by Edward Snowden is where it came from because this is all super secret. And law immediately, everyone managed to pivot onto the issue of whether or not Snowden was a bad guy for leaking it. I'm going to move that over here and say forget about that. You have that debate in the hallway outside. That's not what I'm going to talk about here. But some of the things that were just in the bullet list from the Guardian story. So in one six-month period, we're talking about 1.8 million chats. And this went on for three or four years. Um, Marissa Meyer was out there. This is a whole new level of violation of users' privacy. That was a Marissa quote. I'll come back to that in just a second. Large quantity of sexually explicit images. People were shocked, shocked to find out that there was any nudity in any of these images. One sample that they tested, they found 7 point something percent. So it's 7.2 percent of the images here, give or take, had what the report, what the government report, honest to God, called, quote, undesirable nudity. <laughs> Now, the Yahoo executive goes nuts because you're violating our users' privacy. Okay, fine. But when, first of all, get straight that when Yahoo, it doesn't have to be Yahoo, when Yahoo, Google, Apple, Microsoft, any of them, talk about protecting your privacy in this case, it's a little bit of a shift in the word. They're not really concerned about your privacy. They're concerned about their ownership of your data, right? They own your data, not anybody else. So that's the government has stolen it from Yahoo, is what Yahoo's mad about. All right. And that they didn't know about it, right? That the GCHQ was doing this abetted by NSA. Now, here's the other thing I want to ask about this, since we're all laughing about the undesirable nudity. I am astonished that this pivoted to the Snowden thing so fast that no one asked the following question. What percent of those were minors? This was not in any article anywhere. If I were a journalist or an attorney of any stripe, that is the question I would have dived on and not let go of. Are you kidding me? 1.8 million in six months. So you're talking about how many images here total? 
right? Millions of images. Uh, you know, call it seven, eight million. Seven percent of them have nudity. So you're into the, you know, still close to 100,000, maybe more. What percent were minors? None? I, anybody? Every 1% of them that, that you decide as minors is going to be thousands of child pornography images for every 1% that you put into that. Images of child pornography that were taken without a warrant by one country's government, abetted by another country's government, and offered to all of their analysts without restriction within this program. So, is anyone pissed off? Is that okay? Right? To me, this is a huge issue. Right? I am not okay with that going on without any kind of a warrant. I'm just not. I don't think that should be allowed. Now, the organizations, NSA, GCHQ, are by, by definition non-prosecutable. You cannot go there above the law. But I would still ask, has there been, an, I mean, do you know how many are minors? Is there a list? Has there been an audit? Should there be an audit? How many people have accessed the images of minors? Has anyone at any point taken an image home or gone to someone else and said, hey, look at this, right? Is there a list? Should there be a list? I think this is a big issue and it's coming to a head. Now, I'm bringing this up, I was just at the SNEA conference and, um, and the CTO from HDS, whose name escapes me just at the moment, it was Eric somebody, I, I, I looked it up, I, I'll have to apologize to him later that I forgot his name, but he gave a great uh, presentation all on the security and privacy issues. The, uh, this is an area where Europe is way ahead of the U.S. or the rest of the world. Now, I, I guess ahead is a value statement. I, I would claim it's ahead. They're really updating all of the privacy laws throughout the European Commission to the extent where when you get through to the end of the license agreement for your free service and you click OK, regardless of what it said in that user agreement, that no longer constitutes express consent to give away your personal data in any way. Right? Well, so yay Europe if you like that kind of thing, right? You can now move there. Uh, and they also have other things going on like their right to be forgotten case. There was the guy who, who just won his case to go get his internet history scrubbed and, and, you know, and be forgotten. That's a hard thing to go do. Now this makes it hard to do business in Europe because now you've got all of the, all of the uh, stewardship issues of if someone wants to be forgotten or am I protecting all of their privacy? These are really gonna be rough regulations to comply with. I personally think it's a positive direction, but if you're gonna ask me about socially responsible computing and scalable computing right now, that's gonna be my number one hot button issue. So I wanted to get it on there. All right, so conclusions. Demand for HPC undiminished, continuing to grow. We see that everywhere, but uh, specialization now winning out over standards. Software is a bigger issue than hardware. BK, I apologize. Everything you said about power, I get it. Power is hard. Software is going to be harder. Software is harder than hardware. Skill sets are harder than facilities in terms of how we're going to build these things out. And regulation is going to play an increasing role, not only in big data, but across HPC. You look at what's going on in finance. You look at what's going on in oil and gas. Every one of these industries has regulation coming down on them like God's own thunder in terms of how they're going to protect clients' investments or environmental problems or, or these privacy issues. Regulation is going to get tougher and tougher in high-performance computing uh, areas going forward, not just this year, but I think for the next decade. All right, that's it. I went uh, five minutes over. I always do that. Sorry, Brian.